be the biggest bang in the history of music. But the finale of Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony didn't come out of some cosmic nowhere. Even though Tchaikovsky himself said he based the structure of the work on Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, this is no ordinary victory symphony. It is nothing less than the story of the darkest time in Tchaikovsky's life and the woman who helped bring him out of it. In the spring of 1877, Pyotr Tchaikovsky was already hard at work on his Fourth Symphony. At the same time, he was working on an opera based on Pushkin's Eugen Onegin, the story of a middle-aged bachelor who lives to regret his rejection of a lovely young woman. Tchaikovsky, who wore his emotions vividly on his sleeve and felt them more deeply than was probably good for him, was being hotly pursued at the time by one of his young female students at the Moscow Conservatory, and he saw the parallels between his own situation and that of the fictional Onegin. But what Tchaikovsky did not factor in was his own closeted homosexuality and his fear that it would become public. His denial of this essential part of his nature led him to marry his student, but the marriage was an immediate and unmitigated disaster. Tchaikovsky tried to be as candid with her as the manners and language of the time allowed, but he realized that he could not keep up the pretense. He fled, he attempted suicide, and with the massive support of relatives and friends, it wasn't long before he got his life back on track and with a renewed creative urge. A few months before he had started to work on his fourth symphony, Tchaikovsky had been introduced by correspondence to Madame Nadezhda von Meck, an extremely wealthy widow and patron of the arts, who made it a condition of her support that she and the composer never meet face to face. Between 1877 and 1890, they exchanged over a thousand letters, and von Meck's financial support eventually made it possible for Tchaikovsky to leave the conservatory and work full time as a composer. Tchaikovsky poured his heart out to Madame von Meck in his letters. He explained to her, there is something so special about our relationship that it often stops me in my tracks with amazement. I have told you more than once, I believe, that you have come to seem to me the hand of fate itself, watching over me and protecting me. The very fact that I do not know you personally while feeling so close to you accords you in my eyes the special status of an unseen but benevolent presence, like a benign providence. Tchaikovsky realized the significance of Madame von Meck's entrance into his life, and he knew he wanted to dedicate his new symphony to her. In his letters, he refers to it as our symphony, or even your symphony. In February of 1878, he wrote her, in my heart of hearts, I feel sure it is the best thing I have done so far. But when she asked Tchaikovsky what their symphony was about, Tchaikovsky hemmed and hawed, explaining, as composers often do, that the answer was to be found in the music and not in words about the music. He still obliged her with a program in which he identified the opening fanfare as, quote, fate, the decisive force which prevents our hopes of happiness from being realized, which watches jealously to see that our bliss and peace are not complete and unclouded, which, like the sword of Damocles, is suspended over our heads and perpetually poisons our souls. End quote. He told another friend that, quote, Of course my symphony is program music, but it would be impossible to give the program in words. It would appear only ludicrous and raise a smile. I must tell you that in my simplicity I imagined the plan of my symphony to be so obvious that everyone would understand its meaning without a specific program. End quote. Tchaikovsky was also very clear that his inspiration for what he called the central idea of the symphony was Beethoven's Symphony No. 5. Beethoven's Fifth is generally considered to be the first victory symphony, beginning with the sound of fate knocking at the door and traveling from darkness to light to end in a blaze of glory. After fate has announced itself, Tchaikovsky's story takes an interesting turn. He wrote later that this melody came to him in a dream, and it came to him in the form of a waltz. 
Now, the waltz is, after all, dance music, meant for happy times and celebrations. But this waltz is more melancholy, lonely. It's as if Tchaikovsky was trying, unsuccessfully, to mask the sadness inside. As Michael Tilson Thomas says in the San Francisco Symphony's Keeping Score television program about Tchaikovsky's fourth, the drama he's writing about is a much larger story, the story of any soul in any condition who's experienced that fear of being an outcast for one reason or another, and who is seeking desperately to understand why he should be singled out to be in that role. And where can he possibly escape to, to find solace, relief, joy, end quote. Homosexuality in Tchaikovsky's day was becoming more open, but it was still officially a crime. Marriage was the opportunity to put a socially acceptable mask on his true nature, but it was all too much for him, and fate intervenes once again in the form of his suicide attempt. The second movement begins with a song, a familiar, wistful melody that comes at you as if from far away. Michael Tilson Thomas says one of the greatest qualities of Tchaikovsky's music is its songfulness. Singing is an essential part of Russian musical experience, especially the singing of folk songs or religious songs. And although this tune is original to Tchaikovsky, he wants to write it in a way that will evoke the folk tradition. And in its day, this was a somewhat revolutionary thing to do." End quote. As Tchaikovsky recovered from his suicide attempt, Nadezhda von Meck offered him her country house as a retreat, and as it turned out, it was the perfect setting. The atmosphere, the country, and the servants singing their own folk tunes all reminded Tchaikovsky of happier times, and he felt his creative juices flowing again. By the symphony's third movement, Tchaikovsky has recovered enough to play, and that's what this part of the symphony is all about. He starts by calling it a scherzo ostinato pizzicato. Now, scherzo simply means a joke in Italian, and ostinato means that something is going on obsessively in a continuous rhythm. Pizzicato is the plucking of strings on an instrument that's usually bowed, and in this case, Plucking is all the strings do throughout this whole movement. It takes precision, elegance, and endurance to make this work, but when it does, it's an amazing effect. Suddenly, in the middle of all this incredibly precise and difficult string work, Tchaikovsky inserts what may be one of the most fiendishly difficult solos for any wind player, after doing essentially nothing from the beginning of the symphony, the piccolo player suddenly has to play 21 notes in about three seconds. The San Francisco Symphony's piccolo soloist Catherine Payne calls it an Olympic event for piccolo players. Tchaikovsky was proud of the way this musical experiment turned out, but eventually it began to annoy him when his musical joke became the most popular part of the whole symphony. Finally, the big finish. Tchaikovsky returns to the happy times at Madame von Meck's estate by quoting one of the most famous of all Russian folk songs, In the Forest Stands the Little Birch Tree. 
It's a melancholy song, and it keeps intruding on the movement's exuberant spirits, but it can only postpone the inevitable victory of this victory symphony. Tchaikovsky's private triumph may have been short-lived, but the public triumph of his Symphony No. 4 still fills concert halls around the world. You can find out more about Tchaikovsky's Symphony No. 4 in the San Francisco Symphony's Keeping Score television program on PBS. It's also available on DVD. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.